A lot of things go on in the head. Children, they need to be exposed to bugs to develop an immune system. Now that means that orifices, that is the nose, the mouth and the ears, they can become potential sites for problems to develop. And that is why this topic is discussed in pediatrics. Now each of these diseases has its own unique presentation. So it's usually not a differential. You just know what to do. So welcome to this channel. My name is Dr. Sayed Kazmi and today we will be talking about the pediatric ENT disorders and I will be focusing on high yield practice points. But if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, uh, please do subscribe and give me a thumbs up and also press the bell notification icon so whenever I upload a new video, you are always on board with me. So let's dive and get started. So the first thing that we are going to discuss today is otitis media. Otitis media means infection of the middle ear cavity and it's caused by respiratory bugs. In practice, it is seen that most of the cases are viral in origin, but nevertheless, bacteria can also cause acute otitis media. Now, the child who's got otitis media is going to be in pain, and usually it's unilateral. So this child would be having a unilateral ear pain with or without fever. Now, kids will usually pull on their ears, but remember, in case of otitis media, there is usually no pain with pinna manipulation to relieve the sensation. The diagnosis is usually confirmed by pneumatic insufflation in which a little puff of air reveals a tense immobile tympanic membrane. Now, when you do otoscopy and you see things like bulging red angry membrane with loss of light reflex, it is indicated of uh, fluid behind the ear, but it is not pathognomonic of otitis media. So keep it in mind that though if we see a red bulging membrane, and with the loss of right reflux, it is indicative. It is not diagnostic because the only one thing that is diagnostic of otitis media is pneumatic insufflation, which we rarely do. Okay. Now, these types of uh, infections, they are treated with the uh, amoxicillin, which is a first line drug because the pathogens, bacterial pathogens that usually causes the most common is streptococcus pneumonia. It is followed by non typeable Haemophilus influenzae. I'm not talking about the, the Haemophilus influenzae type B, but the non typeable strains of Haemophilus. And the third one important bacterial strain is Morixella catrolis. Now, most of these bugs are quite sensitive to amoxicillin, so that's why amoxicillin is the first line treatment of otitis media. If the infection doesn't clear with amoxicillin, then we have to give co -omoxiclab. Please also keep it in mind that if kids who are allergic to penicillin, uh, you can give them either clarithromycin or azithromycin. So, amoxicillin or clarithro or azithro is the first line drug for o acute otitis media. That should clear up the infection in most of the cases. If it doesn't clear it up, what is the next step? Go omoxiclab. If it occurs again and again, then obviously something else needs to be done. And in that case, uh, because usually if they've got recurrent otitis media, that would lead to what we call as a glue ear. So there will be fluid behind the ear. Uh, this actually means that they actually go on to chronic otitis media. So in that case, we need to equalize the pressure on both sides of the membrane. So we have to uh, put grommets in the ears that would allow the pressure to equalize on both sides and also allows the fluid behind the middle ear to drain outside. And that would prevent deafness in the long run. So remember these things about otitis media. Now, moving on, let's talk about otitis externa. Now, otitis externa presents as unilateral uh, ear pain, just like otitis media. So remember, the presentation could be the same. Otitis media and otitis externa both present with acute, in most cases, unilateral uh, ear pain. Remember, sometimes uh, kids who have got problems uh, can also present with bilateral otitis media. That's a bit rare. So otitis external and otitis media, especially if they are unilateral, can present like uh, with, with the same symptomatology. But in case of otitis externa, there is pain on palpation of pinna unlike media. So pain could be like the, the dull pain could be in both of the conditions. The only thing is that if the child pinna is manipulated, that would lead to excruciating pain in case of otitis externa, but not in case of otitis media. So this is one clinical differentiating point between the two. Also, as far as organisms is concerned, most of the time it is caused by pseudomonas. And pseudomonas is a bug which is associated with water. 
So it is caused by frequent contact with water, like those kids who are swimming a lot, they might develop otitis externa. Sometimes it is also occurs with kids who have got eczema uh, of the ear canals. It can also be caused by repeated trauma and infection by Staphylococcus aureus. So if you put a, an autoscope inside and you do the examination, you might see an angry arithmetous uh, ear canal. Though most of the cases, they do improve spontaneously, but sometimes you can treat with ciprofloxacin drops. So 0.3% ciprofloxacin ear drops are a good uh, treatment for otitis externa. It also becomes very important to educate uh, these kids or their parents not to put anything in their ear and to dry their ears after swimming and showering. So this is very, very important uh, practice point for an otitis externa. Moving on and talking about sinusitis. Now, sinusitis occurs in older children. It's quite rare in young kids. Number one, kids are born, they do have like a maxillary sinus uh, when, when, when they are born, but these sinuses take time to develop. Frontal sinuses, usually they don't develop before a child is nine or 10 years of age. The so sinusitis is, is very, very, very rare in kids who are less than like nine, 10 years of age, unless until they've got like some anatomical defects in their sinuses so it would be usually the teenagers or adolescents who uh, might present with, with sinusitis the sinusitis in very simple words is uh, infection of the uh, nose uh, sinuses all those sinuses which are surrounding the the nose so it could be the maxillary sinuses it could be ethmoid sinus it could be the sphenoid sinus it could be the frontal sinuses most of the time it is the maxillary or the frontal sinuses which are infected Usually these kids have got some uh, existing problems as well. They might have a deviated uh, septum or they might have some anatomical defects in their facial bones, which like predisposes them to develop sinusitis. So how do they present? Usually most of the cases they present with uh, purulent, uh, we call it like greenish, dirty, greenish, yellowish, uh, foul smelling, bilateral nasal discharge. So it's not unilateral, it's usually bilateral. Unilateral discharge you have to rule out foreign body bilateral is in older kids is usually because of sinusitis and whenever a child or a uh, adolescent has got a purulent bilateral nasal discharge it is it, it means that there is uh, something wrong nearby in, in the sinuses they also may complain of a congested stuck feeling in the nose and they might have some sinus tenderness so like if you do facial tapping they might have like tenderness on the on, on, on the uh, forehead, or they might have a tenderness to facial tap on the maxillary sinuses. And that's why facial tap is a sensitive uh, physical finding because tapping an inflamed sinus always hurts. Now, in the past, radiographs used to be done because they would show air fluid levels and opacification, especially if there was chronic sinusitis in the sinuses. Uh, but these days, x rays are not done. Uh, in chronic sinusitis, uh, usually CT is done, but it's, it's in most of the cases it's, it's clinical diagnosis you don't need to, to go very often for um, for a ct scan to rule in uh, sinusitis because they are expensive and they are usually reserved for refractory or what would uh, we call it as recurrent sinusitis and to make sure that there's no congenital defect in the sinuses but before you label somebody with uh, having a sinusitis uh, it is important that you make sure that it is not just a cold, which is just a regular viral illness. So if it has been only greater than 10 days or is getting worse over a week, so somebody who's got like a stuck feeling in the nose with bilateral purulent nasal discharge, plus minus, sometimes there could be fever, sometimes there might not be fever, especially if they're taking like antipyretics. Uh, so you think of sinusitis. The only thing is that it very closely resembles like upper respiratory tract infections, I was rhinitis, so you have to wait for a week to 10 days. So only if it is greater than 10 days that you would be uh, presuming that it is a bacterial infection. And usually, because it's an upper respiratory infection, if it is bacterial one, we would treat them with amoxicillin, which is the first line, or if they are allergic, we would treat them with azithromycin or clarithromycin. Uh, moving on and talking about uh, one of the most common illnesses of children. This is by and large the most, most, most common illness of all times. Kids, adults, old age, anyone. 
we call it common cold. Now, common cold can be caused by a variety of different viruses. I think there are more than 200 different types of viruses which can cause common cold. But by and large, the most common are rhinoviruses. So the rhinoviruses is a family of viruses. And again, there are so many within that that can cause common cold. So infection by one does not confer immunity, life of immunity. You can get infection from another member of the same family. So rhinovirus is by and large the, the biggest family that causes common cold. After that, we've got the coronaviruses. And I'm not talking about the COVID-19 here. There are other coronaviruses as well, alpha as beta, uh, which can cause common cold in children. So these are trivial uh, bugs and they just cause a viral illness for four or five days and then it goes away. Apart from then, the one which can cause a bit like a little bit more severe variety of common cold are adenoviruses. So adenoviruses, again, they cause like what we call as uh, rhinopharyngitis, but usually uh, it's a bit more severe because there might be a bit of more high grade fever with that and uh, or there can be like bilateral um, conjunctivitis with, uh, with adenoviruses as well. So most cases of uh, common cold, and again, remember the, the 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 presentation can be very varied, but in most cases, in most cases, it usually presents with mild fever. So either, either the fever would be there or the fever might not be there. But if the fever is there, in most cases, it's just a mild fever with rhinorrhea. So usually in the beginning, as the virus is multiplying in the nasal passages, like the, it activate the cyclic AMP uh, and GMP pathways, and there's a lot of like secretions coming from the nose. So there is clear rhinorrhea. After some time, it might become a bit more thick and then that would lead to congestion as thick secretions are not easy uh, to get rid of. So that would lead to stuffiness. So beginning mild fever, then rhinorrhea followed by congestion. And because the same secretions are, you know, uh, dripping back into the throat as well, that leads to irritation of the uh, larynx and cause a dry hacking cough. So a tickly sensation in the throat is because of these secretions dripping down and it can lead to a troublesome dry cup. If it goes further down, then obviously it can lead to more um, complications, but usually in most of the cases they are mild, so it can lead to uh, bronchitis, it can might lead to bronchiolitis in very uh, young kids, or it might lead to, e to acute viral disease in those kids who are susceptible. So it either might remain as a mild upper respiratory tract infection or sometime it can go down cause bronchiolitis very small infants or might cause acute viral wheeze as well. Uh, findings are usually limited to if you examine their uh, throat they've got like mild pharyngeal inflammation so just a non-specific mild erythematous uh, pharynx or a bit of inflammation on the tonsillar pillars uh, along with clear or mucoid nasal discharge, you might see like a sort of a clear or a thicken, like sometimes it can have a little bit, little bit of yellowish tinge to that as well. Uh, and as I told you that in very young uh, kids, it can lead to bronchiolitis and a little bit older kids can have acute viral disease. So usually we start with that, but after four or five days, might go down as I told you, can present with these uh, complications as well. No treatment is necessary for common cold. Most of the cases, they get better on their own. So within five to seven days, sometimes it can go up to 10 days, depending on uh, which virus is causing that. Again, I told you more than 200 different types of viruses cause that. Like if it is adenovirus, it will give you a bit more higher grade fever and it will take a bit more uh, to calm down as compared to the milder viruses belonging to the rhinovirus or the coronavirus family. So no treatment is necessary. All that is needed is if the child uh, is uncomfortable or is got fever, Paracetamol is what is needed. If the fever is not controlled alone by paracetamol, again, then it can be alternative with, with ibuprofen. Uh, clears uh, what you call uh, nasal discharge can be cleared often. Or if there is congestion, then saline nasal drops can be put in the nasal cavity every four hours to uh, loosen this thickened secretions and make it easy for the child to either cough it out, sneeze it out, or simply like swallow that and get destroyed in the stomach. So no treatment is necessary. Most of the cases would get better within seven to 10 days on average. But uh, you should always tell the parent that the cough would be the last thing. So if a child has got a dry, uh, tickly cough with the uh, common cold, that's usually the last thing to go. So it will take a couple of uh, weeks usually. So two to three weeks, uh, the dry cough stays on and then slowly and gradually 
uh, gets away because the viral uh, remnants they remain permanently attached to the uh, to, to the cells the, the epithelial cells and it's causing a constant activation of the CAMP and CGMP pathways leading to uh, secretions post nasal dripping and that leads to a constant dry cough which is more troublesome at night so again it different types of uh, symptomatic treatment can be given but we don't recommend antihistamines in very young kids because the uh, potential for side effects is more as compared to any beneficial effect that might be given by these antihistamines so that's why it is not recommended they don't make any much difference as far as the improvement in cough is concerned so bottom line is no treatment is required for common cold then moving on to two other conditions pharyngitis and tonsillitis one of the most common causes of uh, you know fever and presentations to the emergency departments now what is pharyngitis pharyngitis in very simply word mean inflammation of the posterior pharyngeal wall so the posterior pharynx if you uh, see the picture on the uh, right side over here uh, this one let me uh, draw once so if you see over here so there is a mild diffuse inflammation of the posterior pharyngeal so this is the posterior pharyngeal wall here you can see the posterior and the anterior tonsillar pillars and this is the uvula so you can see like dilated uh, blood vessels capillaries over there with a bit of redness mild redness so this is what we call as mild grade inflammation of the posterior pharyngeal wall and the tonsillar forces and this is characteristic of viral pharyngitis so pharyngitis in most cases is viral in nature rarely if it is associated with inflammation of the tonsils sometime it can be caused by bacteria and uh, but still like you know statistics show that most of the cases are still uh, viral in nature so it usually presents as a sore throat so the most important finding is a sore throat so a child would complain that his throat hurts and when the throat hurts they usually have got pain on swallowing so they're not able to swallow without pain so that's why younger kids who usually refuse to eat so you know one parent should bring their child with fever and let's say a little bit of runny nose and they would say the child is not eating he's refusing to eat why is he refusing to eat because there is inflammation it is a painful condition so when the child tries to eat or swallow something it hurts so that's why they refuse they give them something and they will push it out and they won't take it and there could be plus minus fever some of the cases might have got a mild fever some might not have a fever again it depends on which virus is causing them sometimes the fever can even be of a moderate uh, grade where it can go up to 38.5 and sometimes even 39. It can sometimes lead to tonsillitis or might coexist with it. So if it coexists with tonsillitis, we call it pharyngeal tonsillitis. Again, most of the cases are viral in nature. Sometimes if it is associated with lack of cough and a bit of adenopathy, then you can think of a bacterial infection. Streptococci are the common bacteria that can cause uh, bacterial pharyngitis. So for that, we can do the rapid uh, streptococcal test. So it's an antigen-based test. It's a quick one. It's very specific, but it's not sensitive. So it simply mean if it is positive, you can like say, well, fine, this is being caused by, let's say, strepto group A streptococci. But if it is negative, it does not rule out. So if somebody is fulfilling the central criteria, which is actually the criteria uh, which we use to see if a child would need antibiotics or not, so we use a center criteria so uh, the key, the thing is that if rapid strep test is positive well and good if not then uh, probably we will have to go for taking culture swaps for cultures and see which bacteria is known so central criteria is a criteria which gives you excuse me, <coughs> four or five marks for uh, some of the features that we look for so one mark for fever one mark for if there are exudates on the tonsils one mark for uh, adenopathy one mark for um, uh, if there is no cuff and obviously uh, one mark if the child is less than 15 years of age and we minus one mark if the, if somebody is more than 44 years of age but obviously I'm, I'm just focusing on pediatrics so I just want I don't want to go into that detail so somebody who's got one score well that you would treat as a viral one somebody who's got two or three score on the central criteria you probably would think there might be a chance that it might be bacterial so the best thing would be to do a quick uh, uh, rapid streptococcal antigen test if that is available if it is four then obviously you have to treat them with antibiotics so usually the antibiotics that is used are penicillin so phenoxymethyl penicillin is used here in uk it's a narrow spectrum antibiotic but it's very good for the common bug that causes uh, pharyngeal tonsillitis and that is streptococci so group a streptococci are still very sensitive 
to phenoxymethylpenicillin, which is otherwise a narrow spectrum antibiotic. So it is only used for tonsillitis. So you would use that. If you think it is viral, the best would be to give them benzidamine 0.15% throat spray. So this is an anti-inflammatory throat spray and it just cools down the throat. It reduces the pain uh, sensation on the throat so the child uh, can uh, swallow, the child can take his food, take his feeds, whatever. So benzidamine 0.15% spray can be used every four hours. And as I told you, if uh, it is bacterial, you would either give them uh, phenoxymethyl penicillin or if they're allergic to it, then you would go for it. The macrolides, erythromycin or clarithromycin, whatever you've got available with you. A tonsillitis means inflammation or infection of the tonsils. Again, uh, it can be viral, it can be bacterial. Again, we use the central criteria to differentiate between viral and bacterial. Most people I've seen in practice, they're still treated with antibiotics. So uh, the stats like the microbiological statistics of otherwise still like those which feel like bacterial are still viral in origin. So it's mostly viral, but uh, usually if there are heavy exudates and pus on the tonsil, like for example, if you see this picture on the right side, you can see that these are the two inflamed tonsils and you can see islands of pus. So there are whitish, you know, these exudates on the tonsils and both tonsils are equally enlarged and inflamed. So this is bilateral uh, tonsillitis. Again, tonsillitis in most cases are bilateral. If it is unilateral, then you would be thinking of like uh, um, Quincy. Uh, uh, what call it like paratonsillar abscess. So mostly viral, but if there are exudates, you would think of bacterial infection. As I said, rarely it can lead to a secondary development of pus behind the tonsils. We call it as Quincy. In Quincy, you will see that one tonsil is bigger than the other one, and usually the uvula is deviated to the opposite side. So if that is the case, then an antibiotic alone would not help that abscess needs to be trained and obviously you would involve the ENT guys at this point in time because the area needs to be numbed and obviously after numbing you put a needle in and train uh, the abscess. Again, um, pharyngeal, uh, this uh, bacterial tonsillitis is treated with uh, phenoxymethylpenicillin. It's a narrow spectrum antibiotic that I told you very effective against streptococci. If a child has got more than four attacks per year, which requires antibiotics or is affecting the quality of life, now that child becomes a candidate to have elective a tonsillectomy. Again, different trusts and different um, school, school of thoughts have got different guidelines, but nevertheless, I mean, if somebody's life is being affected, if there are got like not many attacks of tonsillitis, then they uh, should be considered for tonsillectomy. Uh, so if they are not improving after five days of antibiotics, then you should be considering other conditions that can mimic uh, tonsillitis, especially the Epstein-Barr virus infection. So if a child is adolescent, uh, or a teenager develops tonsillitis, you see and you diagnose it as tonsillitis, you give them antibiotics, amoxicillin or phenoxymethylpenicillin, they are not improving with it. Rather, sometimes they might deteriorate, they might develop a rash or simply the sense the, the symptoms are not improving, then you should be thinking of Epstein-Barr virus infection and in it, that it is very important that rather changing antibiotics, you should be doing a monospot test to rule out Epstein-Barr virus infection. Or rarely, it could be a sign of leukemia as well. Remember, leukemic infiltrates in tonsils uh, can cause tonsillitis and that tonsillitis doesn't improve because it suppressed immunity and antibiotics alone cannot do that. So remember, a tonsillitis practice point, a tonsillitis which is not improving if the adolescent think of Epstein-Barr virus infection. Irrespective of the age, if it is not improving, you should also consider uh, leukemia as well. So obviously you would do the blood test and you might have to do a chest x-ray to rule out hyalur adenopathy as well. Uh, moving on and discussing uh, the final um, topic in pediatric ENT disorders and that is epistaxis. Again, that is one of the common uh, causes of visits to ED. And epistaxis means bleeding from the nose. So bleeding from the nostrils is epistaxis. It could be anterior epistaxis if it comes out through the uh, anterior nostrils. It could be posterior epistaxis if it is uh, trickling back into the oropharynx and then might lead to hematemesis uh, as well. Uh, but nevertheless, some of the cause is in the posterior pharynx. Most of the times, again, most of the times it is caused by a habit which is we call as nose picking. So kids have got like habit of putting the fingers in the nose, picking their nose, removing the boogers and uh, by that process they can damage the delicate blood vessels, capillaries 
in the uh, nasal epithelium leading to epistaxis and in most of the cases unilateral and again in most of the cases that bleeding episode lasts less than 30 seconds so kids can get this off and on if it is bilateral uh, obviously you have to rule out other causes because sometimes trauma to the facial area especially the bridge of the nose leading to nasal fractures and other things can cause bleeding uh, rarely uh, some uh, clotting disorders, especially one Wilbrand factor deficiency, can also present with the recurrent epistaxis in children or some of the qualitative platelet defects like burnout solier or glass thromboasthenia can sometimes again present with uh, um, one uh, with present with epistaxis. And rarely uh, it might be also a feature of what we call as heredi hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, which is also known as Osler's Weber Rendu uh, syndrome, in which you might see that there are small telangiectasias on the skin. So these are malformations of the capillaries and it is present in the nose as well. And it can bleed with a little bit of pressure, trauma, or uh, you know, even, even when the MBS is hot. And in adolescence, it could be uh, the secondary to growth inside the nasal cavity most commonly nasopharyngeal angiofibroma it's angiofibroma because it's made of fibrous tissue and a lot of blood vessels which can bleed on touch so that can cause so it remember most of the time it is usually caused by uh, finger picking or digital trauma but if it is occurring weak if it is recurrent or if it's associated with other symptomatology then you have to do a workout so you look at the quick profile you will look at the platelet count you might do the uh, um, von Willebrand assays to see if there is any von Willebrand deficiency and you might have to uh, do a CT of the of the sinuses or you might have to put a scope inside to see if there is any growth inside the uh, nasopharynx. Uh, the other thing is also always whenever you are uh, you know dealing with it case of epistaxis, always examine the nose to see if there is any foreign body. Kids, sometimes they put foreign bodies inside their nose and that can also damage the nasal epithelium and lead to epistaxis. So how do we treat it? Treatment is by compression of the nares. So we always ask or the parents to pinch the nose and obviously they have to bend forward. They do not have to bend backward because if they are bending backward, pinching of the nose, they would just be drinking their own like epistaxis. So posterior epistaxis and the blood would be going down and into the stomach and later on they would have like a vomiting which would have blood. So the best thing is to pinch the nose and lean forward. If it is posterior epistaxis then obviously you have to put a tampoon inside it's just like you have to do a packing and obviously when you're doing the packing of the nasal cavity you have to give them broad spectrum antibiotics to cover staphylococci as well because um, staphylococci can cause widespread like you know uh, infection uh, when you're using these packings and other things, so the bacteria staphylococci can simply like you know that can be pushed inside the in the blood and cause like you know havoc within the body. So uh, if we treat it with pressure. Yes, if it is repeated one, and if you haven't find out any other cause, you have rule of one Willebrand deficiency. If there's one Willebrand deficiency, we treat it with desmopressin. But nevertheless, I mean, if you have ruled out these these causes like other causes, if somebody has got recurrence, then cauterization uh, uh, can also help so like uh, chemical electric cauterization of the uh, bleeders can help or uh, in cases of um, chronic sometimes humidified uh, air also helps in uh, improving the epistaxis and reducing the recurrences so this was all about some of the common high yield pediatric ent disorders which you normally see in practice these are the cases which you would normally see in your emergency department this is your day-to-day -day practice so we have discussed some of these common conditions how to differentiate between them and what is the treatment so once again quickly revising that otitis media is infection of the middle layer cavity usually unilateral but sometimes can be bilateral as well and there would be a uh, fever with pain but remember when you are manipulating the pinna there is no pain because the pain is because of the middle pressure in the middle ear cavity not on in the on the outer uh, ear canal which would cause pain by pulling on in otitis externa when you are pulling manipulating with it's excruciatingly painful so if a child cries like even if you pull out that is otitis media if he's tugging onto the ears he's got fever and thing but he is otherwise comfortable i mean then it's probably uh, otitis media but nevertheless you have to do otoscopy to rule out between these two things uh, then as far as sinusitis it's more common in uh, older children 
Uh, we talked about pharyngitis and tonsillitis, which are mostly viral, but can be bacterial as well, and they are treated with uh, amoxicillin or penoxin and penicillins. And then we talked about epistaxis and told you that epistaxis is usually caused by digital trauma. It is uh, treated by pressure and forward bending. If it is recurrent, then you can think about cauterization or treating the underlying condition if you find out any. Okay. So this was all about uh, these conditions. Hope you have liked this video and I hope you have learned something. So if you have learned something, do apply it in your practice. And uh, if there is still any question or uh, if you are puzzled about something, you can put your uh, question down in the comment section below. And uh, I will try my level best to uh, answer you as soon as possible. So thank you very much and have a good day. Bye bye.